Welcome to Acquire Connected, the podcast that is your compass in the world of data across environmental, social and governance. Welcome to the Acquire Connected podcast. This podcast features interviews with thought leaders and technology experts who are tackling data management challenges in the geoscientific, environmental and social performance industries and their impacts on the Earth's resources, the natural environment and the communities around them. I'm Jamie Nobbs, your host for this podcast, and today we sit down with Stuart Vanderwater, Environmental Lead at Acquire, and Mike Walkador, Technology Advisor for Enviruses at Acquire. In this episode, Stu and Mike take us through the world of environmental data management, how and why it's captured, what kind of data is already being collected but we're not necessarily reporting on, and how companies can ensure they leave no data behind and get the most out of their existing environmental data. Let's get started. Hi, Stu and Mike. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to have you on the podcast. Stu, would you be able to kick us off by telling us a bit about yourself and a bit about your background? Uh, Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jamie. So I'm Stuart Vanderwater or Stu. I'm the Valley Stream Lead for the Environmental Valley Stream within Acquire, which is basically effectively a general manager uh, for our environmental products and strategic lead. So I've been with the uh, Enviruses product, which is our, um, I guess, our flagship product in the Environmental Value Stream for uh, a long time now. So I um, actually started my uh, career as, as a developer uh, and have come across the journey along the way. So I've done all manner of uh, implementations of uh, environmental software. So really have gone right across, you know, from the development side through to the implementation side. And, you know, I guess got a really good bridge appreciation over the time of how people manage their data, especially in the environmental space what people are doing well and probably what people aren't doing so well, which is, uh, I guess, where our our products come in. So that's that's me. And how about yourself, Mike? Sure. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, Yeah, my name's Michael Wolfgau. I've been with Acquire almost two years. Probably from the accent, you can tell I'm from Canada. But I've been a technology advisor during that time, also with the Enviruses product. Before that, though, I've got a bit of a varied experience across mining and construction through... uh, geology, project management, and quality control management in uh, Canada and the States. So a lot of site experience to contribute to uh, where we're right now. So you've both been working in, I guess, the world of environmental data for, for quite some time now. If we go straight into like the basics, when we're talking about capturing environmental data, what sort of data are we talking about and what sort of industries actually need to capture this data? Yeah, it's a, funny enough, it's actually a pretty big question because there's just such a broad variety of data that comes into environmental data management. Um, it's very multidisciplinary, which is almost makes it a little bit unique in some ways. So uh, you're asking um, people to be really a jack of all trades to get everything from, uh, you know, especially water quality and air quality, I guess, are the big ones. But there's everything from like, you know, flora and fauna, waste, uh, even now a lot of emissions reporting. So, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot there and um, there's a lot for people to have to, to manage. Yeah, I like what you said about multidisciplinary because beyond the breadth of data types, there's also a breadth of industries that are looking at this data now. So you've got, I mean, obviously you have mining and resource industries, but you could have airports, port authorities, processing plants from operational standpoints. And then even from academic standpoints, you've got universities that are collecting this data for research purposes. Really, any operation that's of sufficient capacity to impact the environment is, through its works, will will need to collect and report a certain amount of environmental data. So it's very broad. Has this always been the case? Or perhaps was environmental data not so much on their radar in previous years? Um, From what we see, it's definitely always been on the radar. Um, We always come across some very passionate people in the field. So uh, like Mike said, it is quite broad in terms of who uses it, especially, say, in mining. You get people who have studied environmental studies and they've got a lot to do. As we've said, it's very multidisciplinary. So I guess there's a lot more focus these days. I don't know whether it's because of the focus on global warming or those sort of things and protecting the planet, but definitely the regulatory authorities have become a lot more stringent in the way that they not only set down what needs to be done, but how they enforce it. And I guess you know, as soon as you start talking about enforcement, that's where companies tend to prick their ears up a little bit more and pay attention that Hey, we better do the right thing, otherwise there's going to be fines and and, and potentially even more serious um, impacts on their operations. From that, I guess, impact standpoint, 
like capturing that data is not really new, but the analysis of the data and that impact, like Stu said, on forecasting and decision making also has increased lately. So like communities and stakeholders are inevitably interested in the ability of these mining companies to not only forecast their production, the resource or financial outputs and outlooks relating to those, but also they look at the social and environmental aspects now as well and how those will impact the organization and community in the short and long terms. So aspects like regulatory trends and weather impacts and water usage all factor into in some capacity into the strategic planning for the mining companies. So, I mean, as for its prominence, it's as more and more companies are adopting a collaborative and open approach with the communities as well for the E or the S and ESG. Uh, but that transparency is a bit of a win-win for both because it does foster that trust and and faith in their abilities to manage the environmental expectations. But it also engages the community in the collaborative effort and can even lead to kind of like Stu was saying, there's the the risk of fines. And obviously to avoid those fines, you've got your responsibilities and you need to collect data on certain frequencies. Well, they might get more lenient with how often you collect the data if you're showing that you're responsible as an organization. You're showing faith that may be reciprocated by that community. So in long terms, the capturing of the data isn't new, but we're really seeing a greater visibility and openness. Uh, with the public with regards to the data and me, that's the perception that's becoming more important from the from the mining community. It is well and good to have environmental data being regulated quite strongly, but what are the key benefits that you see some of the Envirus's customers taking away from reporting on their environmental data? What are the, the main benefits to reporting on that? Uh, I think like Mark was touching on, maybe in the past years ago, uh, the environmental and sustainability reporting that people were doing is a bit more lip service. Um, they were sort of wanting to be seen to do the right thing instead of maybe really genuinely doing the right thing. A lot of it is based on, well, the, we have to meet these obligations, so we will. Uh, I think more now it's about them being able to proactively manage the environment, the impact that they have on it, work with, as Mike really well points out, the the community, because often they are working in built-up areas or even the community that works within the mine itself. There's a seems to be greater care for people, but also uh, the environment they're working in. So I think that's a big benefit that people are getting now from managing the environment like that. Of course, there's a lot more external scrutiny on, on companies through, uh, say, the emergence of ESG and the frameworks within that. There is investment stakeholders as well now. So if a company does that well, that actually gives them a better reputation in the marketplace. Yeah, really. I mean, on a on an operational standpoint, adopting a system like Enviruses encourages cooperation between your teams because you may have, we see often, we see you've got a soil team, you've got a water team, and they're all disconnected and they all have their different systems. You can really unify the solution within one database. And not only does that generally improve the efficiency of the system, but it also allows for you to glean lessons between those data sets that you may not have gotten otherwise to be able to correlate lessons between what you're seeing in your soil chemistry versus what you're seeing in your water quality versus what you're seeing in your water bores and your water levels. This is something that's possible when you have it all in one solution, one one source of truth, so to speak. Then on that public side that I was mentioning previously, having that data all in one solution and then being able to provide something like a community portal or an, an, an avenue for the community to log in and see your recent data right there on the screen rather than them have, having to wait for the obligatory reporting period or what have you, it's right there for them to see really encourages that uh, transparency with the community. Yeah, and I think notwithstanding the fact that the people managing this internally will be getting a lot of uh, requests for data from a whole variety of stakeholders. And when it's not very well organised, it does take them a long time to respond. And sometimes it's too late it's after the fact. So there is a lot of risk mitigation that can be gained from you know, getting everything in one spot. So obviously not missing reporting deadlines is, is pretty important because that can lead to non-compliance, but also being able to answer questions in a timely manner, um, even things like, you know, when should we water based on, you know, wind and forecast trends. If we don't do it in a certain time frame, then we're going to get dust exceedances. You know, we, we're, in, we're in a built-up area, we're next to the school. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. So it can be as impactful as that. So, you know, having everything together, and, and Mike makes a great point about being able to have those data sets alongside each other, sometimes there's correlations that if you have them alongside each other in the same sort of format, you can get those sort of insights out of it in order to be able to make those timely and, and sometimes pretty impactful decisions. 
I think you've made some great points there in terms of it's not just about ticking the box. There are a lot of benefits to companies reporting on their environmental data quite well. And I guess in terms of the repercussions of of not reporting on environmental data well, you mentioned fines. There are obviously regulatory requirements. Are there any other, I guess, repercussions that you see, particularly in that social space perhaps, that come about from not reporting on your environmental data well? But definitely the side of bad publicity um, is is an obvious one that because especially the communities that have a real vested interest are watching these things really closely and they will scrutinise where they can and make a lot of noise. So, you know, there is that perception thing, but there's, you know, that sort of genuine need or want from these companies to ensure that they are looking at uh, looking after the areas, so you'll often see they have town halls in the community, and they'll try to be, you know, they'll publish their data and be as transparent as possible. You know, that social aspect can't be underestimated. Also, um, I guess you know the fines are one thing, but you know, not doing it well could also impact their ability to operate. So you know, we've seen in some areas if they're not doing it well, then they might actually have to, in some way, modify their operations. You know, we've even something like um, we did a project with a, one of the main ports in Australia and they were doing a, a channel deepening project. So they actually had to ensure that the uh, the dredge wasn't having adverse effect on the wildlife and the ecosystem there. So if they did detect that the turbidity went over a certain level, they had to stop dredging. And I guess from that perspective, it would cost them, you know, $100,000 a day to stop dredging. So you know, not doing it well, not recording it well, not having the right data, uh, not monitoring it in a timely manner can have pretty big repercussions. But really what Stu's saying, beyond the the fine aspect, there's that collaborative, I guess, environment with certain communities as they're linked to, especially mining projects. Like there's a there's a mine that I've I've been to that they had agreements in place with the local farmers and the local town that it was bordering on. And that involved water use, land use, especially with regards to the farmers, what they would use with the water and especially the treated water. There were agreements in place that made the operation mutually beneficial between those parties. So it's not always just fines and slaps on the wrist. It is something that does inherently impact the operation day to day. So, Yeah, and even going to some of our other types of customers like water utilities, it's sort of next level because they're looking and monitoring data about their product, which is water, but it's drinking water. So this is directly going to people and has the absolute uh, ability to harm if it's not managed well. So, you know, there can be real physical repercussions when it comes to, um, you know, not managing this data well. Yeah, I can I can see how that's quite detrimental, not having uh, drinking water. Um, yeah, you've mentioned in terms of some of the repercussions of not capturing environmental data well. Now, what are some of the ways that people do capture their environmental data? So you did touch briefly in the previous question on Enviracis, which is acquires environmental data management solution, but there are plenty of systems out there, I'm guessing. What what are some of the ways that people actually capture this environmental data and then store this information? Yeah, um, big question because, you know, we've mentioned a few times now that environmental data is multidisciplinary. So, and there's actually three layers to it as well. So there is purely the breadth of different types of you know, environmental aspects we're looking at. But then there's also a, a number of different sources like you've asked. So there's people actually uh, in the field, in the in the mine sites, taking physical samples and observations. They're often sending that away to a laboratory or some sort of third party who's doing analysis and then um, you know, sending it back to that company to look at. There's also data coming from devices near real time, plus also other systems that might be in and around collecting sort of you know, uh, data on the operations. So you've got a number of data sources on a number of different types of monitoring. And then there's the frequency. So all these things are coming in everywhere from like one second through to one sample in a quarter. So having something that helps you sort of get all those together and not forget a bit, so even though the once a quarter sample is very infrequent, often that is quite important when it comes down to your overall compliance because it is telling you something quite important about the full chemical or quality makeup of what's going on in your environment. So that's really the challenge is to make sure that none of that is forgotten, that it is all accounted for in an equal manner as well, that you're not really relying on or focusing on one thing over another. In terms of capturing that environmental data, is that the same challenge that all industries face or is that 
say, particularly just in the mining and mineral exploration industry? No, it, it is really, it really applies to many industries, but it's really dependent on A, what are they collecting? What are they collecting it for? So my previous example, you have operational footprint. So you got a, you may have a mine that's operating a single site. They only have to collect a certain amount because they're only reporting a certain amount. Or you could have a company that has 10 different working mines across multiple states that all have their own requirements and obligations. Their sheer volume of data that they're collecting, but also the levels within that tier system that Stu was mentioning, they'll, it'll be inherently greater than that single site. And then going to the other extreme, you have a university that's not really doing it for any uh, reporting requirement, but it's purely academic. They don't really have that requirement. It's really just collecting whatever they can to towards their research. So it's really situational depending on, I think, what that reporting requirement is for those sites or companies or entities, really. Yeah, it's a really good point, Mike. It's almost like there is actually a fourth layer just to add to more complexity to it that even within the same organisation, uh, different operations can have different requirements and they can be more stringent. They might have an underground operation, which has you know very different environmental monitoring to an above ground operation. Even things like um, uh, construction and those sort of things, you know, the air quality is one that's big, but also noise and vibration is really important for them. So like Mike said, even though you might look at a, a mining and go, okay, well, they're going to do everything, everything's slightly different. And and no, there's almost like no one size fits all in this subject matter. So that's why there's so much, you know, so many different moving parts that uh, we have to really be aware of and we make sure that we uh, leave none of it behind. So we've dived into now, I guess, the type of environmental data collecting, how they collect it, what they collect it for, the repercussions of them being, whether that's universities, mining companies, water ports, port authorities, any of those. We've now dived down into all of that. But what can sites do to not only get on top of their environmental data management, but also get ahead of competitors? So we know it's a, a legal requirement or regulatory requirement for a lot of mine sites, but surely there's a way that they can actually use this environmental reporting to also get ahead from a operational benefits or efficiency advantage. I think there's some real basics that a lot of people aren't quite getting to even to start with. And I guess, you know, when people often ask us about how prevalent things like machine learning and AI is in environmental data management. And for me, it isn't that prevalent because people still struggle with the basics because you know, generally the environmental departments aren't as well funded as, say, production, which you'd expect. Um, so really the things they need to get on top of is, you know, trying to spend a lot less time wrangling with the data and more time looking at it and seeing what it means. And you know, that's an easy thing to say, but how do people you know, get out of that crush of data and different sources and frequencies and all of those sort of things? So it's really around like the whole, as you'd say, upstream and downstream. So where are they getting the data from? What form are they getting it in? Having conversations with their data providers to ensure that, look, if you can provide it in this format or that format, that'll make it easier for you, makes it easier for us. We can automate getting all of that sort of thing managed. And then we don't have to rely on people, you know, downloading it from a website or getting it from an inbox or something like that, pasting it into a spreadsheet. And then once you're in a spreadsheet, you're making potential errors and those sort of things. So a lot of it is trying to automate a lot of those streams, reduce the manual handling. So then you've got more time to say, oh, what is it telling us? You know, how do we report on that? Are there insights that we could actually start utilising more proactively to you know, mitigate risk of what's going to happen on site? Yeah, pretty similar to, to my sentiments on the matter. And this one really speaks to me, having been on that site level and lived, lived this, uh, this struggle. But ultimately, it's get organised. It's really so important to have a clean and organized data set because you're you're reducing those inefficiencies, you're reducing that lost information, that late response or that missed response entirely. You're collecting that data, but you still need to be able to use it. So not only from that regulatory or compliance perspective, but also to manage that day-to-day -day site activity. Like Stu was saying, you're receiving data from all these different monitoring programs and they're in their own sets of obligations and requirements and they're stored in emails and they're at the lab and they're in Excel documents or different databases, different teams. It's so difficult to take that information and make an informed decision at site level, especially when time's a factor, just makes it all the worse. And then that environmental responsibility is working to prevent incidents and negligence from occurring, but 
also be able to plan accordingly when things go wrong on site, because inevitably it will happen. And that clean and organized data set allows you to, or gives you the tools with which to tackle these issues promptly and efficiently. And Mike touches on a really important part about building in, you know, that getting organized, but building in that auditability and traceability within what you're doing as well. Just the other day, I was looking at some customer data that we were working with, you know, getting it into Envirus to send. It was in a spreadsheet. And so like they've got some factors on the first sheet and they've got all these other workings in later sheets. And I found probably, you know, one quite bad issue with the formula, which wasn't copied properly. And then there was another one which wasn't referencing those factors on the first sheet at all. It was actually hard coded in there. So once again, if you're not being able to have a system that has that transparency and has those rules and rigor in that, then those errors that get introduced at some stage then start going right through and become systemic issues uh, with the way that they're managing data. So like we said, it's not sometimes the big flashy things at the other end, it's getting the basics right and really getting organized. So important. Yeah. And in terms of, I guess, having that that clean auditable data, just going on to the, the data side of things, what sort of data are people potentially collecting and not necessarily reporting on that you actually see an opportunity for companies to uptake? Uh, yeah. So uh, as we've said many times, most of the data is being reported or is being collected to report on. But I've seen cases of the operational level data, such as flora and fauna, for example, examples of operations that are collecting flora and fauna data, but not so much for reporting or correlation with other data sets. Examples being, especially in Canada, it's common to encounter sites that collect data on wildlife sightings purely to alert their crews in the field on any wildlife that's in the area, notably bears or other threatened species like caribou, just to avoid areas of risk in encountering these animals. So in itself, this data is useful on the day-to-day because you're you're minimizing the risk of those site crews. But taking that data and correlating these sightings with other data sets, maybe noise or production data, and you could probably glean some lessons into the impacts that your operations are having on the wildlife populations. Maybe they're driving certain animals to certain areas at certain times. These are lessons that, while they may not be impacting the bottom line, they can be impacting these, especially in threatened species cases, their ability to thrive in the area. And these are lessons that can help those species, but also help your engagement with the community. If you can glean those lessons and actually have a positive impact on those animals, great. And then in the case of bears, if you can glean those same lessons and avoid certain areas during certain production times to reduce the the risk of those crews to those animals, potential animal encounters, all the better. It's a safer environment, right? So I think there is certain niche cases of, of that data that's being collected, but not necessarily being used towards a same system that might be collecting and reporting on water quality data or noise data in the same same manner. That's a really interesting point you've kind of touched there on yeah, the impact it has on the, the environment and the surrounding wildlife, but also, yeah, the safety of the crew. That's not really a, an area that I guess a lot of people would probably consider when, when talking about environmental reporting. Stu, are there any cases uh, that you can think of, particularly like in Australia, that, that we also have some similar or where environmental data can come in handy for I guess, safety reasons or or other areas that don't necessarily fall into that reporting regulatory requirement? Yeah, I think that we, um, we had an example up in Queensland where one of our customers just tracking rainfall uh, locally was really important because basically if they had a certain rain event, they'd have to um, evacuate the mine site because it wasn't safe. They could actually get um, trapped in all the roads and those sort of things would be shut off. So it definitely wasn't a regulatory thing, but that was an operational aspect which they had to collect. So that was pretty important. Uh, wildlife, I guess we don't have as many things that can kill you in Australia like we do in Canada. But I'm sure a lot of people would argue with that. But. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be a lot smaller and um, and a lot less prevalent. But um, but even things like, you know, koalas, uh, sightings and those sort of things. So we've got a, a customer that actually puts their koala data into uh, Enviruses to then help share and look after the koala populations and use that for sort of research purposes in conjunction with, you know, not only the government there, but local, uh, a large, you know, wildlife zoos and those sort of things. So... 
you've both now touched on the, the product Envirosis. Before we wrap up, would you be able to give me an overview of, of Envirosis, how it aligns with, say, this like clean and auditable data that you've mentioned? Yeah, the main the main benefits of using a system such as Envirosis, potentially instead of, like you said, spreadsheets. If you've got data coming from lots of different organisations, how, how does one solution actually help them? Yeah, um, potentially it doesn't because um, if, if the system doesn't have the ability to take in all those different types of data, then you know it's going to do some things quite well, but then it won't do others well. So you do see some platforms which have started life just, say, focusing on a particular monitoring aspect and then has tried to sort of shoehorn other things in. Uh, I guess that's the one big benefit of Envirus is it started its life from the get-go, being able to take in any type of data from all those different things we talked about right to the flora and fauna challenges, which Mike also talked about. And once again, we, you know, it's not aiming to try to do the big flashy things at the end. It's about trying to do those basics really well of environmental data management, you know, setting expectation of when we're meant to be getting data, tracking if we got that, whether it's one second data or, you know, one quarter data, you know, informing people about when things need to be you know, known about. Because there's so much coming in, you can't possibly be looking after at it all the time so it needs to almost manage by exception so be able to set up rules to say look let me know when this sort of event happens or that sort of event happens let me know if we missed data all of those sort of things are really caught the cornerstone uh, of Enviroses it's and it's very adaptable so you know it's everything's able to be done by users in the front end so if they have a you know sort of almost like even a niche monitoring program we're going to actually look after this thing over here they can then go and create that model that in the system and then um, collect and report on that data. So I think that's the real use case that people look to for it, that it goes, oh, so you can do that, do that. Oh, by the way, then you can do your emissions reporting uh, alongside your flora and fauna reporting. So it really means they're not leaving anything out. And like we've talked about multiple times, multidisciplinary, so many different uh, frequencies, sources of data, unique requirements locally as well and being able to cater for everything in between. Thanks, Stu. Thanks for the, um, I guess, the overview of Enviruses, how it works and, and where it sits. So if companies aren't necessarily using a, a data management solution at the moment, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not capturing this data. What can companies do today to actually ensure that they're making the most of their existing data, regardless of what system they're using? Yeah, I think Mike said it best earlier when he said just get organised. It's having a, a good hard think about and almost starting at the end of what are your reporting requirements, what are the sorts of questions people ask you day to day, uh, and then working backwards as to how you can organise that. And getting organised is really critical, and I think trying to think of it as a more of a system instead of the thing that you're doing. And what I mean by that is we know that there's a lot of turnover of staff in the industry as well. Um, so getting it to a point that if you weren't there or you know, if, if someone else has to step into the role, then could they actually get up to speed and start managing that data? Uh, notwithstanding, if, you don't, if they don't get it organised, then you know, if they want to go on a you know, leave for about a month, a long service leave, how do they even do that if they haven't got it organised? Everything seems to stop. So in some ways, they can be you know, almost a little bit selfish and say, look, if I get this well organised, then it's going to help me be able to answer these questions better and have a lot less stress in my life. Uh, but then also, it's, um, it's a much better outcome for the company too. And just to complete that thought there, uh, it's not a one-day job to go and organise the data set, but at least to start and assess where it can be improved is something that companies can do Today, right now, they can start that process of saying, okay, how can we improve our data set or how can we improve the organization of our data set and how can we ensure that we reduce the risk of that inefficiency should that right person go on leave or should we have a regulatory body come in today and ask for this amount of information? How can we go and set this right and make sure that all of our T's are crossed and our, our I's are dotted so that we're uh, ready to prepare and provide that information? And don't be too overwhelmed or um or too alarmed if you find gaps there's almost always gaps when you do this so you'll find there are things that haven't been collected that haven't been well organized it's not unique to you it's a very big issue and because of all the things we said earlier in terms of just how broad it is it's pretty common so it's a matter of then well how do you mitigate that in the future but how do you make up for it in the in the short term as well they are some very good easy steps to to at least get people on the right track thank you guys 
I think that's also a good point to finish on. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you both for, for joining the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks for listening to this episode of Acquire Connected. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, share or subscribe on your podcast player. Thanks for listening to the Acquire Connected podcast channel. Find us at acquire.com.au.